Hello and welcome to episode 106 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And I guess that means I'm James Whittingham. This week, the Biden administration thinks 50% of all vehicle sales in the United States could be electric by 2030. And you know what? They also predict 50% of new televisions sold by 2030 could be color. And the UN Secretary General slams Australia for being laggards on climate change. The Australian Prime Minister countered that he's just trying to get to Australia's Mad Max future as soon as possible. Elon Musk reiterates that all we need is a mix of solar, wind, and batteries. If our TikTok commenters who claim to be smarter than Elon are right, then the answer is perpetual motion machines and nothing else. And Keanu Reeves is thinking about building an electric motorcycle. Perhaps it's to make amends for that last Matrix movie. A whole that and more on this carbon-free edition of The Clean Energy Show. Yeah, carbon-free indeed, because uh, the sun is finally out, spring is finally here, and the snow is finally melting off my solar panels. So I'm making about 2,000 watts of power right now. So on my end, we are carbon-free. Excellent. Here we uh, made about 100 kilometers worth of driving the other day, and it wasn't a great sunny day, and it's not the peak time of the year, and I've got a small system. So um, I just threw that out there on Twitter because people are paying for gas. Mine, the sun didn't, hasn't billed me yet, but uh, <laughs> that's kind of nice of it. It hasn't sent me a, it's free. It's a big nuclear reactor in the sky, Brian. It's just it's raining sunshine on our podcast right now. Yeah. So speaking of driving electric, um, two quick updates on my Tesla. The first is my safety score is still 99. I figured out that... I, it's the following distance that's the main thing. So I could just drive around on the highway safely following people, and, and, and that would get my score up to 100. But you can't do it in the city. You just can't do it. No, I believe it only counts above a certain speed. So it's got to be highway distance, and you need oh. you need a certain number of miles of safe following to erase the miles of unsafe following. Does your Tesla have adaptive cruise control? Yes. So that's you just set that, and then you're set good. that at a maximum distance and hit the ring road around the city over yeah. and over. But there's got to be a car in front of you for it to count, or it's not safe following. Oh, really? Well, the highways are bound to be uh, not terribly busy all the time. You know, I just hit it during rush hour or something, or yeah. just after rush hour. But I don't think I need to get it up to 100. But anyway, so next week I booked a Tesla service appointment um, at our nearest Tesla service center, which is in Saskatoon, two and a half hours away. And uh, it basically to look at the heating system, because I'd heard that there were problems with the sensors. And I definitely had an issue over the winter where the car just didn't seem warm enough. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe it's a faulty sensor or something. So I went ahead and booked a service appointment, was planning to drive up to Saskatoon next week for this appointment. And um, they sent me a message. They asked for more information. They asked for dates where I had put it up too high and, you know, it wasn't sort of warm enough. So I, I told them uh, New Year's Eve, December 31st, is when I, I drove up to Saskatoon when it was minus 36, and I definitely had the heat all the way up to high, but it wasn't quite warm enough. So anyway, they checked the logs, and then they did an online diagnostic for the car, and then I got a message back just this morning, you know, greetings from Tesla service. We've done an, an over-the-air diagnostic, and they tell me that everything is working as designed. Oh. So I did always kind of wonder that, that... It, it always seemed like, yeah, the car was not giving me enough heat because it didn't want to. It, it wants to conserve battery. So I think that's all it was, was just that the car gets stingy about how much heat it wants to give you in those extreme colds. And then they have a tip here to use recycled air more often. Yeah. And that's yeah, something yeah. I never do. I always leave it on fresh air because, you know, you always want fresh air in the car. So, But in it, the winter, the, the, that really steams up fast as soon as you hit that recirculate button. It, it can. So it, it recommends, you know, switching that on and off to keep the, the windows clear. So it's spring now. So I'm going to have to wait another, you know, uh, until next winter to sort of try this out. But uh, that's the plan. Use recirculate air more often. And then if this happens again, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get it get it fixed next winter. But, yeah, I think I'm just going to cancel that appointment. The uh, Chevy Bolt has um, sort of a, an information screen that says how much 
uh, of your mileage went to uh, heating the car and so on. Uh, I think you, you can look at uh, details on that. You can't on my particular car, but a lot of cars you can get information on on that. Is see w with my Leaf Spy that hooks up to the dongle uh, via Bluetooth, and you get data on the car. Um, it was telling me, you know, seven thousand watts, something like that, uh, full heating, and when it's not, so it, it'll tell me exactly. Um, so I'll I'll know if it's holding back, Brian. <laughs> no, and I I believe I would need some kind of a third party app to see that because in the normal Tesla thing, you you don't really know how much power is going to the heat. Anyway, Brian, my blood pressure is up this week, so I can't get angry on the show this week, so it's all happy news. Oh, okay. Well, that's, I mean, bad news, good news. Okay. Well, my doctor's looking into it. We can't <laughs> figure out why it's up suddenly. It, it could be death. So uh, we'll take it one show at a time, um, and I won't sign off just yet. But I thought I found this interesting, speaking of range and Teslas, the Tesla's starting to account for wind, air density, and more when doing a range calculation. So that's air density. I'm impressed by that. You had me a you know, wind, but air density, that's that's cool. Yeah. It calcul it, that affects, we talk about the range in the winter. One of the reasons range for everybody goes down is air is denser. Yeah, that's crazy. I have noticed in the two years that I've owned the car that the range calculation has gotten a lot better. It seemed less accurate when I, I first owned the car. So, yeah, that's great news. Well, um, I've got a, a segment here called What James Learned because... Sometimes, Brian, I learn things, and I like to share it with everyone. I don't pretend to know everything, so let's just do that. We are willing to learn. What James learned. I learned this week, Brian, that there's a, such a thing as lim limiters put on household power meters for people who don't pay their bills. Now, as a young man, I would sometimes get a little behind in my bills in my apartment, as you have may have guessed. Yeah, and isn't there some story where you ran an extension cord into the hallway to get power? Yeah, I powered everything <laughs> from the hallway to my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> it was a small building, so there wasn't a lot of coming and going. But yeah, that was my own great electrical revolution. Um, yeah, and uh, the, it's amazing what a little bit of power will do you when you know, uh, you don't have any. Just, just, having a little bit is a lot better than having none, uh, especially nowadays, because I could run my TV, let's face it, and fridge, the two things that I needed to keep going <laughs> at the time, maybe a computer. So, But there's such a thing as limiters that are put on household power meters nowadays for people who are not paying their bills on time, or, uh, or de default, instead of cutting them off completely, they are limiting what can be powered. And anything that's 240 volts won't work like your oven your dryer so people have to use microwaves to cook and air fryers and it's happening in calgary in canada uh load limiters allow for continued operations of a furnace a few lights and small appliances but only one at a time so if too much electricity is used at once the limiter will trip turning off power altogether until the meter is reset physically by the client or remotely by the distribution company have you heard of that? I have not heard of that. No, it's like one of those boots they put on your car if you're parked um, illegally somewhere. But yeah, this is a big issue in cold places like here because there's there's you can definitely kill people. It's happened in the states recently. But there's, you know, there's rules about you, you know you really can't turn somebody's power off when it's minus forty outside if there's a, a risk of them dying. But if you're a shut in without any social contacts and you are living in Texas and there's a blizzard and you have no heat and power, I mean, people have died that way. So it is it is kind of uh, scary. So uh, another thing that I learned, I, I watched a big interview with somebody who was pro-nuclear and very knowledgeable about the industry um, talk about the Georgia plant, which I was talking about last week because it's the only new construction of nuclear in North America. They have an old 1980s two-reactor plant, and they're making it four. And it started something like 15 years ago, and they're they're still not done, to my knowledge. <laughs> um, and it's gone way, 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 way over budget by billions and billions of dollars. And the time, of course, is double of what they said it would be. So I, I learned a lot of little nuances about nuclear and why that didn't go well. And it's interesting. It's it's the theme is that it didn't go well because no one knew how to build a nuclear reactor anymore. We haven't been building them in years. The decades. knowledge has been lost, yeah. 
largely since uh, you know Three Mile Island, there hasn't been a lot made in this part of the world. There's there's France and and uh, China starting supposedly going to build a whole bunch of them, but not tomorrow. Um, and uh, basically, you have to build it like you build the pyramids. Uh, you have to build it forever. It does, it's not like anything else. And that the I was talking to my son about this. The civic engineering involved is is more exacting, of course, than anything else in the world, um, as you would imagine. So people don't know how to build, so they have to start over and figure out the rebar again, and and do all kinds of things. And then you know some of the people who made the reactors and turbines went out of business. They were big companies. They went <laughs> bankrupt for this. So um, a lot of people come to me and they say, Jimmy. The answer is nuclear. And I say, why? And uh, they say, because. So nuclear, in my mind, th this just sort of cements, uh, pardon the pun, my impression that nuclear can't be done quickly. You know, we might get to a point where we, we could decide today to nuclearize the world. Yeah. But it would take probably 25 years and before we got- And 25 years later, we'd have a few working- Yes, and and it, we'd maybe be good at it by then, but <laughs> um, it's too late. I mean, the, the carbon uh, glass uh, full is filling up and it's going to overflow, and we, we don't have any time. We have to stop it now, and that's one reason why I'm kind of impressed with some of the things that China is doing. They are doing a large reduction of their emissions in this decade rather than waiting to 2060 when they're at zero. So they are, that is important. What we do now is important. And just today here in Canada, we had a um, political situation happen where the two center left and left wing parties got together with an informal agreement to keep the liberal party in power until 2025. So uh, three more years, that would make it a full term of a, uh, as if they'd wanted a minority, but they have in their uh, minority parliament. So a lot of the Canadian climate people I've seen are saying, hey, uh, this is good news for the climate because we'll have some stability on that issue and we'll continue to get the things off the ground. And that what happens now is real so important that if, you know, because the other parties on the right have said they're not going to support anything climate wise. No. And of course, it's yeah, it's just the it's political fodder at this point. So, um, you know, whatever's good for the planet apparently doesn't matter. But yeah, it, it relates to our discussion last week about the carbon tax, because I'm trying to figure out how to completely decarbonize my house and our rental property. And you have to take the carbon tax into account. Like, are we going to buy a new gas boiler and let that run for the next 20 years? But each year that gas boiler is going to get more expensive because of the carbon tax. So yeah, you, you don't want to spend all this money to get rid of natural gas in your house and then the government changes in a couple of years. And yeah, if it runs till 2025, I'd say there's a good chance that those carbon taxes are safe and won't be repealed. If there was an election tomorrow, yeah, they yeah. might just get rid of them. That's true. Like a lot of these things will have a chance to be around for a while. And um, my wife screamed in joy when she heard that because it said they're one of the main things is uh, dental and she can never have enough dental. <laughs> All the dentists in the city could work on her and there wouldn't be enough. It's so so the new work. coalition government is promising dental work? Uh, free dental. Wow. Boy, what, what? You don't learn a lot in your bomb shelter there. That I was big news last look, night. I'm just, I'm surrounded by concrete. I don't know anything. <laughs> I hope you have your iodine pills ready because <laughs> there's a madman in Russia who has nukes. Um, here's another one. Speaking of uh, those bastards, uh, Russia that's said in the news could destroy nearly half of Ukraine's renewables worth $6 billion. So something you don't think about, generally they don't bother blowing up a power plant. They just take it over as we've seen with the nuclear plants, but no, they're blowing up the, the renewables, which is worth a lot of money. So yeah. That's not and helpful. if they blow up the renewables, then they'll just need more of that uh, Russian, Russian oil gas. and gas. Yeah. So 70% of the mass launched into orbit this year will ride on SpaceX even before they get the Starship going. What are they going to use Starship for? I thought it was just to go to Mars, but is it to launch big things into space too? Yeah, Starship will be for everything. Like that'll really be the everyday replacement. Eventually, it's going to take them a long time to get there. You know, proving a new rocket platform is like super slow, but no, they're going to use it for everything. So like right now they send a, 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 a like a Falcon 9 up to launch those uh, Starlink satellites, right. but they can only do about 60 at a time. 
Whereas once Starship is running, they'll be able to do a few hundred at a time. It's just cheaper. The You know, the bigger economies of scale come into it, and, the, you know, the bigger the rocket, the cheaper it's going to be to launch stuff into space. Okay, from Renew Economy, there's a report here on the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, and he has slammed Australia for being laggards on climate change. So he had some very harsh words for Australia. And of course, lots of countries are laggards, but um, Australia in particular has set themselves up in a, a particularly bad light. So yeah, they, they uh, Australia's target is a 26 to 28 percent reduction from 2005 levels by 2030. But, uh, the, you know, this is just simply not uh, fast enough. And uh, yeah, the, the UN Secretary General naming them uh, in, a, in a big speech and um, it's just not going fast enough. Um, and, you know, this leads into another uh, article from The Guardian. Can I just say that we slammed them before the UN did? Oh, yeah. We were, the, we were on top of this. The we whole were totally event. on top of this. We were yeah. serving our two listeners in Australia <laughs> and providing all the news possible. <laughs> uh, but this gets me to my next point, which is a story from The Guardian about a study led by uh, Professor Kevin Anderson from the Tyndall Center for Climate Research at Manchester University. And his main point from the study is it's the wealthy countries that have to step up mm -hmm. and green their economies uh, more quickly because uh, we're the ones that can afford it. So, um, you know, Australia is is a wealthy country. They they shouldn't be uh, lagging like this. It's it's the developing countries, the poorer countries that are going to have a real problem. It, you know, if there was a quick switch to, uh, you know, all electric economy countries like South Sudan, uh, you know, the Republic of Congo and Gabon, you know, they are small producers of oil and gas, but it's a small economy and it's a bigger percentage and they would be devastated um, if it, their economies had to switch. So, yeah, this is a, uh, a reminder that it's the wealthy countries, including Canada. Uh, we're, you know, doing a bad job of this as well. We just need to go faster. And... So here's an example. Oil and gas revenue contributed about 8% to the U.S. GDP, but without it, the GDP per person would still be around $60,000, the second highest globally. If all oil and gas was taken out of the economy of the U.S., they would still be the second most prosperous country uh, on earth. So the richer countries can afford to do this more quickly. And, we, you know, we need to force our governments to actually do it. Yeah, and we are fed here in Canada, an oil rich nation, a lot of crap like that, that it will kill the economy. It will kill jobs. Uh, hogwash, I say. It's not true. It leads me to another point. I know a couple of weeks ago we were talking about Saskatoon, the city near us, and they did a study. They've, they've had a couple of electric buses, and they figured out, hey, if we actually switch to all electric buses, it will save us $66 million over, I think it was the next 20 years or something. So the other point of this is, and this is one thing that the UN Secretary General pointed out, is... Australia, it's just a bad financial decision, too. Um, if if you're investing in oil and gas, these are going to become stranded assets. It's a bad investment. And, you know, countries and jurisdictions that go more quickly into renewables are going to be better off financially in the long run. If you have a government that's denying all this and just investing heavily in fossil fuels, it's just going to bite them on the ass eventually. It's it's yeah. uh, some economies may not survive it if if they make too many bad decisions now. So, you know, we have two cities in our province, Saskatoon and Regina. Saskatoon may go ahead and make that decision to go electric on buses. Maybe our city waits five years makes bad decisions, buys more buses, and guess what? Our city taxes are going to go up, and they're not going to go up at the same rate in Saskatoon because they've made better financial yes. decisions. Yes, and that's infuriating when people aren't very smart on these things, and they'll go to the bus convention, and they'll tell other people, hey, it's working great, and, you know, because they have bus conventions. You know that. Of course. Uh, they have all kinds of conventions. That's what people do in City Hall. They, they go to <laughs> conventions for the, whatever their field is. Uh, but, you know, if you were a, say, a delivery company uh, in a city and you had 100 vehicles 
And Joe, the other guy, your competition has a hundred vehicles and he doesn't believe in any of this stuff. He's, he's doing fine. But the, your company changes to electric and starts saving. Uh, and then you can lower your costs by 3%, 8%. Uh, and then suddenly the other guy can't compete anymore and he goes bankrupt. So this is true for city halls and companies and the free market. And uh, it's only going to be whatever it is today. It's becoming more truer every day. So, yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, it's going to be absolutely insane to do anything otherwise. And we're going to get to that story next, because I uh, wanted to talk about a clean technica op ed piece talking about how Biden is so happy with himself for um, having half electric vehicle sales be Sorry, for ha- for being happy for himself for having half of all car sales being electric by 2030 in North America. That would be some great achievement. And journalists are asking, well, is that even possible? You know, I mean, goodness gracious. Uh, and it is it is absurd when you, you think about it. And, uh, and I cringe when I saw that. And I, I knew that that was hogwash. You know, it's, it's not going to be 50%. You, you can't have 50% of anything. That's like saying... You know, 50% of people with flip phones are going to be 50% flip phones and 50% smartphones. Like the half of the population is going to be perfectly happy with their flip phone. They're not going to notice their neighbor with the smartphone and, and want to upgrade. They're just going to stay like that. Half the population. That's the same thing. And then, you know, the the the, guy, the smartphone is cheaper than the flip phone because the flip phone is on technology. And, you know, it's it's just it's not going to work that way. You and I know that. Our, our listeners know that. Um so it, it it's just kind of stupid. And the title of the article is BEV market share 50% in 2030. How stupid do they think Americans <laughs> are? And it says the mainstream media are plotting and wondering if it is not too ambitious. Ha! They listen in awe to the self-appointed leader of the global EV transition, GM CEO, Mary Barra. In 2030, she says, uh, 50% BEV market share. Uh, no. That's not good enough, and it's not going to work that way. So these smart people in government and industry did not ask themselves why half of the car buyers would choose tailpipe vehicles, while the other half would buy uh, vehicles without a tailpipe. This is my phone analogy. So the battery prices, Brian, declined by half every five years. So what they are now is probably not going to be the case in five years. It's possible. Who knows if there's a world war, but let's not talk that way. So with all the new research, it is likely to be even less this decade. In other words, we're going to accelerate battery prices. And it's hard not to believe. I I literally seen two battery factory announcements per day now. It used to be one per day. Now it's two per day. It's (laughs) just, and these are not small things. These are mines involved and, and giant, giant operations as a, a huge one is going to be announced for North America pretty soon as well. So battery density has doubled every 14 years. That is the amount of energy you can get into the same volume and weight. That's fantastic, and it's very important. But with the new types of batteries coming to market, Clean Technica says it is likely that we will see a doubling of battery density 10 years or less now. And I believe that, too. And it's not a huge thing to, to talk about. No, and not to mention that, you know, Americans are now paying four, five, six dollars a gallon for gasoline, the highest prices ever. Uh, what's that going to be in 2030? Like, it it already doesn't make economic sense to drive a gas vehicle. No. And uh, as, as we all know, the gas prices are going to keep going up, but the renewable energy prices, probably not. And um, Electric just had a story out on how it's costing six times as much to drive an ICE vehicle compared to a gas car in the States right now. And, you know, the United States gas prices are nothing compared to what they are in Canada. And and they're nothing compared to what they are in Europe. So they're twice as much in Europe usually. Um, So it makes even more sense outside of that jurisdiction. So a battery electric vehicle, as we all know, is simpler to make. It's got fewer moving parts, fuel fewer auto workers involved than a comparable gas vehicle and the current costs are high because a series of uh, production are small and the technology is relatively new so with more experience and larger production volumes prices will drop of course you know the next generation uh renault zoe which is kind of like the leaf is expected to be 40 percent cheaper in 2024 that's a big drop for the people and they've been making a lot of those so once you start making them 
uh, and they prove successful, then it goes down in price. Um, the Volkswagen, by the way, just announced this week that it'll invest $7.1 billion to produce battery electric cars in North America and will offer 25 new models um, here in North America by 2030. That's they should be their entire lineup should be done by 2030. His goal is only for 55% of his cars to run off electricity by the beginning of next decade. So that is a mistake. The question is, when will they learn that that's not going to be the case? And is it soon enough to adapt in time? So they conclude by saying in 2030, one choice is far superior to the other, offering a better driving experience and lower costs at the same time. Uh, so why should half the American car buyers waste their money on an inferior product? And when the differences are well understood, one powertrain is much better than the other, and the market will choose a better offering. It will not be 50%. Demand will be close to 100%. I truly believe that to be true. Okay, so um, Keanu Reeves, famous film and television actor, uh, turns out he's got a motorcycle company. Um, he's a real motorcycle fan, a real gearhead. Um, he started, you know, playing around with uh, sort of custom-made motorcycles, and this turned into a real motorcycle company that makes uh, motorcycles, sport cruiser motorcycles, a specific, you know, genre of uh, motorcycles. And, you know, they're now talking about going electric. And if they do that, they would probably be the first manufacturer of the sport cruiser variety. Uh, of motorcycles. What is a sport cruiser variety? I'm not sure. <laughs> Here's Keanu. Aesthetically interesting, seductive machine that handles that corner, one that could be, you know, going down the, the highway, something that, you know, you could have a range, you could be comfortable, but you would also have like a visceral experience. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't help. I still don't know what that means, but. <laughs> I suspect if you had dinner with him for two hours, you still wouldn't know. <laughs> I question the communication skills of Keanu Reeves. There, I said it live on the air. You can send me letters. I don't care. If anybody knows the answer, write us at cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. This is the Clean Energy Show. So Tesla has opened its third gigafactory. This one is in Germany, and uh, rumor has it that the Texas one could be very close behind. Have you heard anything on that? Nothing new, but yeah, uh, they, they are days or weeks away from uh, the, the Texas factory opening as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, Elon was talking in Germany at the opening, he did his dance, which is traditional, <laughs> with a new gigafactory. So they have now have three gigafactories and the Fremont factory. He seems quite excited about it, and we'll hear about his uh, plan for the future soon. Uh, this is what he had to say, though, and this is something that, you know, the TikTok uh, commenters won't like, but this is something that I've been preaching, and here's Elon agreeing with me, and me agreeing with him. Uh, every every pit hope that we make will be another uh, step in the direction of a sustainable energy future. Um, and we will also make uh, battery storage, uh, so this is going to be very important for storing renewable energy, uh, so for solar and wind, uh, because it's intermittent, it needs to be stored. But uh, we are extremely confident that, that the world can transition to a sustainable energy future with the combination of solar, wind, plus battery storage, and electric vehicles. If you have those three legs of the stool, then you can create a sustainable energy future for as long as the sun shines and the wind blows. Now, I, either Elon listens to our show or um, I've, I've already got the idea from him a long time ago. But, yeah, I mean, he, 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 he did a picture of the map of the United States and it was like a postage stamp that would take up all the solar. And I get blowback on that all the time. It's like, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, people, it'll take up too much room. People don't believe it. Well, so what? Yeah. So what? <laughs> you don't have to bury it for a thousand million years afterwards. You don't have, you know, and it's cheaper. Uh, and you can interconnect it with uh, agriculture. And agriculture is going to be changing. We're going to move away from beef and we're going to need less land. 
uh, for grazing and will have that land and it can still be used uh, with multiple purposes, Brian. No, and I want to give some credit to Tony Seba as well, who we haven't talked about in a while on the podcast, yeah. but, um, you know, they ran the numbers a long time ago and decided that solar, wind and batteries was everything that we need. And and uh, I think, yeah, Tony Siba was the first one to convince me of that because we always think about these other things like, you know, hydroelectric is, is pretty good too. Existing nuclear plants, they're pretty good too. But uh, Tony Siba's run the numbers and all of those things are going away because they're just going to be too expensive to even run, even the stuff that's already built. Yeah. And it's, it's not that complicated. Um, you look at, you know, something like batteries decline in cost on average 18% a year, and they've been doing it for forever. And uh, we're only now starting to build a lot more of them, far more than we've ever even conceived of building. Uh, so they're, they're not going to go up in price except for the short term. So it, it's, it's a pretty simple thing to think that you either spend this much money on X or less on Y, and Y won't you? And everybody's got their opinion that solar doesn't work. You and I have it on our roof. We we see the sun shines every day. It it's, it comes up every morning. It is yet to disappoint us in that regard. And uh, we I think we we have more confidence in it because we we see how it works. And and you can just overbuild it because it's so cheap. It's just like when we talked about ground based solar panels. They overbuilt it because the panels are becoming so cheap. So you don't have to have the perfect angle for the sun. Uh, the same is true for, say, building in Canada where it gets cold and the, the days are shorter. You just overbuild it. And then you have some free electricity in the summer to make hydrogen or uh, desalinate water. I don't know. You, you can do different things with it. Yeah. And you just end up with a cheaper power grid. We haven't seen prices come down yet in most places, but, uh, you know, that is hopefully coming. So uh, there's a battery factory that is yet to open as part of the Giga Berlin uh, so that will open up to be making batteries and cars there. Uh, and Elon pointed out that it will include battery storage that they'll be making there. So that's important for the grid. And uh, yeah, I just, it's, it's, it's taken a long time. You know, it's almost a year overdue. It's like 10 months overdue. Yeah, it's, you know, they were able to put the China factory up in about a year, but uh, the regulations in Germany and the EU are a lot more complicated. So it sounds mostly regulations based uh, things that have slowed them down. But uh, yeah, the day is finally here. Okay, another story from The Guardian about the International Energy Agency. So a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, we were talking about, you know, prices for gas in Europe are going way up because of the conflict in Ukraine. And so the recommendation over there was, hey, turn your thermostats down uh, one degree Celsius and we're going to need less gas. And I felt like you were kind of skeptical of that idea. Um, and true, like you're not going to get a uh, 100 percent buy in from uh, the whole population. But I thought this story was interesting. The International Energy Agency is recommending a strategy really for everybody uh, to cut, you know, oil and gas demand. So they've got a list here of things that everybody can do around the whole world that would cut oil usage by $2.7 million a day within four months um, if everybody did these things. So I'm going to just go over them quickly. And some of these would require, you know, government cooperation and government regulation. Um, so first one, reduce speed limits on highways by 10 kilometers an hour. Again, nobody mm -hmm. really wants that, but, you know, if there was uh, a rule, people would, you know, more or less follow it. Um, and as we've sort of probably talked about before, energy use goes up exponentially because of wind resistance. So if right. you go from 100 kilometers an hour to 110, it's not just a 10% increase in energy needed. It's more like four times or, you know, 40%, something like that. So that's the first one. Uh, people could work from home for up to three days a week where possible. And of course, that's already happening. Post pandemic, a lot of people are not fully going back to the office. It should be that way. I, I understand that Joe Biden, I cringed when he said this. He said, go back to work at the office. Why? 
Yeah, why? Why would he? Say, what, what's it to you, Joe? Yeah, what's uh, to you? Pre- Le- leave me alone. Let me do my job. The you way go I want work to. for Vermont or something, you <laughs> son of a gun. Um, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I don't want people to go back to the office. And three days a week sounds good if you feel like you need to have, um, you know, uh, connection with other people and so on. Then three days a week from home sounds perfect. You just do two days, Monday and Tuesday, and then work from home. That's not everybody doesn't suit every yeah. job, of course. I mean. I'm just happy that uh, that we can work from home, that we've proven it. You know, it's been a nice byproduct of the uh, the pandemic. I mean, and you, and people can decide for themselves whether they want to because they were forced to. So if you don't want to, then go to work. But um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. It, it uses less gas, right? I mean, that's one of the reasons we should do that. But you know, Brian, people, one thing I was thinking of, they will not water their lawns if there's a water shortage during a drought here. Yep. They do fairly good compliance on that because yeah. you look really bad when you, if Everyone you can see you. your neighbors are all looking <laughs> at you and pointing. Um, but people like to speed. They do not like to go slow. And it's painful to cut even five miles an hour off your speed limit. No, and I think it was probably Jimmy Carter that did the, the 55 yeah. mile an hour speed limit in the U.S. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, not needless to say, very unpopular. And that was on the interstates, which are these amazing yeah. highways that are really built for speed. Um, yes, and I've done speed on them in my fuel economy. I mean, cars are made to go maybe the most fuel efficient speed of even electric cars and gas cars are around 90 kilometers yeah there's definitely not more than that and as you hit a go beyond 100 you start kilometers an hour 60 miles an hour you start to lose fuel efficiency so if your interstate is 80 miles an hour or a, what is it a 130 or 140 kilometers an hour i know it's a lot it's you really your fuel efficiency goes down like 40 percent uh it's not just a little bit it's a great deal and it's, not, it's also just the there, you know, the dynamics of hitting the wind uh, at higher velocity. So uh, n- things that I don't understand. Well, by the way, there's one thing that I forgot in my uh, in my what James learned segment. I was looking at a, a story on solar, and they had mentioned the term petawatts, and I've never heard that before. And uh, is that above it's, gigawatts? It's oh yes. <laughs> It is. I believe it's the next one up. And for uh, no terawatts is the next one up, but then petawatts. Yeah. And I asked my son, the the kid who's doing all these math classes, and he says, just gave me, oh, it's 10 to the 15th. It means nothing to me. I want to know, you know, trillion, billion, y- you name things differently. You're just adding three more zeros or what's going on here. Uh, write it out for me. The fact that we haven't heard of it before is because we haven't been talking in such terms before. So now we've got a whole new term. You know, terawatt was new to me a few years ago yeah. when we were starting reading stories about this stuff. And now, now look where we are. We're just, it's becoming huge. Yeah, we're going to live in a, a petawatt world for sure. <laughs> I'm going to put that on a t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, stop. Just finish this list quickly. So the next one the IEA is recommending car free Sundays in cities. And it says that Switzerland, the Netherlands, and West Germany all did this during the 1973 oil crisis. I didn't know and that. And some cities have used the measure to promote public health more recently. So, yeah, car free downtowns, car free days. Uh, this is becoming a thing. And it's just way more pleasant not to have all these uh, gas burning cars around uh, make public transport cheaper and incentivize walking and cycling and there's many ways that uh, governments can do this new zealand is having their public transport fares for the next three months cutting the prices in half of public transit to encourage people to use it that obviously is going to affect uh, the demand for oil and gas That's some great. people say free make it free it, it should absolutely be free like this would be um, yeah. Screw the dental plan. Yeah. You know, free transport, public mass transportation, please. Uh, so alternate private car access to roads in large cities, i.e. every other day. So um, depending on if your license plate is odd or even or something, you, you would uh, not be able to travel in your car. Uh, increase car sharing and adopt practices to reduce uh, fuel use. So carpooling is obviously a potential big one. Uh, promote energy uh, efficient driving for freight trucks and delivery of goods. Uh, eco driving techniques, uh, reducing excess weight on trucks, um, just slowing down and speeding up more, uh, less abruptly saves fuel. 
and uh, using high speed and night trains instead of planes. So uh, rail is a much yeah. more energy efficient uh, way to travel. Uh, avoid business air travel well, are, where alternative options exist. And this is another thing from the pandemic. Way more mm-hmm. conferences are going to be virtual because, let's face it, they don't need to be in person. And to uh, reinforce the adoption of electric and more efficient vehicles. So that's the list. If you had to face that or a power outage, like, you know, the threat of running out of reserves of natural gas, maybe you turn your thermostat down if you were Europe or Germany or somebody like that. They would, you know, okay, we'll do it if so we don't have a shortage. And we did change things during the 1973 oil crisis. So, you know, why not do it now? It's rather amazing that we did. You know, it's such a... It was a different era. Different time, for sure. And uh, and yet, we're talking about the same things. So, cool. Anyway, Brian, it is time for everybody's favorite. And it's a fat one this week. It's the lightning round. Hey, from Electric, the Mediterranean's first offshore wind farm off of Italy is nearly halfway complete. Four out of 10 offshore wind turbines have now uh, been installed by Dutch maritime company Van Oerd. I just like to say that. Uh, <laughs> off Italy's uh, Puglia coast. I don't like to say that. The heel of Italy's boot, if you will, Brian. And it's Italy's first offshore wind farm and the first in the whole Mediterranean Sea. So offshore wind spreading around the world. Good thing. Good thing. Um, the first GM Ultium, the first GM Ultium Cadillac lyrics roll off Spring Hill, Tennessee assembly line early. So they're making them. They're finally making the lyrics that we've been talking about forever. And it's a good car. And when they actually start taking orders in May, I'll have another uh, EV of the week segment so we can review their specs. But it makes it's got fast charging and a big range and it makes long range road travel good so and you know let's hope that gm knows how to make cars because i might be buying one Uh, so our friends at the ola scooter people remember those guys in uh, india they're investing in store dot which is a um, battery company in a bid to bring its five minute charging batteries to ola's fast electric scooters so this is an israeli company that has a fast charging battery so StoreDot has uh, fast charging silicon based battery cells, which can be recharged in five minutes in a car that would translate to about 100 miles, or 160 kilometers in just five minutes uh, in a scooter. I imagine good things. So, yeah, instead of maybe battery swapping, uh, the only reason you battery swap is because charging takes too long. Um, That's encouraging. Although on a scooter, maybe the, the swapping still works better. But still, it's one solution to not swapping, I guess. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the e-scooter world in India. Would you rather fast charge or swap? I'm more of a swap guy, but uh, hey. Also putting that on a t-shirt. Um, Toronto will be testing 20 to 40 large cargo e-bikes in its downtown core. The large e-bikes are fitted with a box or a platform. It's like a little trailer with pretty hardy wheels that can haul that practically looks like a big screen tv in the picture like pretty big things you know um the large e-bikes fitted with this platform will be allowed to park in commercial loading zones and delivery parking zones that are currently used by trucks and vans interesting toronto it's it's would you say it's not terribly snowy i mean sometimes you get a huge dump but a lot of the times it's just it's almost like West Coast, like it's just kind of rainy. And yeah, it wet doesn't in the stick winter. around like it does here, but uh, yeah, they do get their fair share of snow. Canadian company Tyga has started deliveries of his electric snowmobile. You can see that on our TikTok channel, and the fastest unit does zero to sixty in two point nine seconds, Brian. So I'm thinking, hold on tight, maybe, because first of all. We've established that much slower than 2.9 seconds in a car makes me dizzy and almost pass out. Mm-hmm. What would it do on a snowmobile? Yeah, that's If too you don't fast. know what a snowmobile is, it's like this craft. It's like a personal watercraft, but on snow. And speaking of personal watercraft, Brian, they also make personal watercraft that are electric. Yeah, and I believe I mentioned this last winter, but we were out at the cottage recently, and it's very much snowmobile weather. It's nice out. There's still lots of snow, but it's warm. Tons of snowmobilers out at the lake, 
and they are noisy and smelly. And then it's the same thing in the summer. It's all of these personal watercraft, the sea dews, the the jet skis, and um, they're just incredibly loud. And then they're incredibly smelly, so they make all this noise, you know, driving past you. And and otherwise, like the lake at this time of year is just beautiful. Like there's just snow everywhere, and yet it's warm out. You're going for a lovely walk, and then this insane noise passes you. And then a minute later, you get the fumes, and it's disgusting. There is no regulation of the fumes. And I read a review in the States uh, where they drove one in the Northeast, and the reviewer was saying, well, you know, some most people who, who have grown up on this stuff are going to miss the smell. Well, I say <laughs> screw you because that no. smells not healthy for you. No. It's like saying you'll miss the smoking, so try this. Um, yeah. No. And the smell is just a testosterone thing. I think uh, you'll get a an even greater sense of traveling fast when you don't hear it. And, and even the most hardened, drunken you know, snowmobilers are there for nature. Yeah. You know, they're like hunters. They appreciate nature. And they will you, you like can't it say they don't. much more without that noise and without that smell. Yes. Yes. I'm telling you, there's so many great things. And you know what? I was thinking it takes about three hours to charge one of those from an F-150 Lightning electric truck. So if you're out in the bush, um, you know, you could charge it with your electric truck and still have, uh, you know, lots of charge left over to get home. Or maybe you'd spend a couple of hours... Uh, charging it from, you know, 20 to 80% or something like that. You wouldn't be using the whole battery. Or maybe just topping it up over, say, lunch. You know, it's, it's possible. You get some more. It's too bad. It, 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 they go about 140 kilometers. So, and the watercraft uh, work. And this is a Canadian company, Taiga. Taiga, pardon me. And um, very exciting stuff. Um, people are looking to maybe invest in them, but... I don't think they're going to be as profitable as a Tesla or any other, you know, bus company and larger item things like that. But still, very cool. And I would love to have buses that are electric that are quiet. I would love to have electric snowmobiles. And, you know, electric bikes are popular again, not because of the pandemic, as they were at the beginning of the pandemic, is gas prices. So another double whammy for, for electric bikes. No, Both that's a much the cheaper commute in a, uh, in a bike if you even have to go to work. If you do have to go to work. So Volvo Car USA and Starbucks are collaborating, strangely, to establish the first public electric vehicle charging network at the coffee company's U.S. stores beginning this summer, powered by the uh, ChargePoint company, which makes electric vehicle chargers on the highway and in grocery stores. Volvo Car USA will install as many as 60 Volvo-branded ChargePoint DC fast chargers at up to 15 Starbucks locations where... Along a 1,350 mile or about a 2,000 kilometer route between Denver and the headquarters in Seattle. Now, I've been down there three times in that area, and I don't know anyone who would go from Denver to Seattle. It's just an odd route, you know? Yeah. But they've decided to fill them with chargers at their, at their uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's, that is that is a bit odd. You'd think they would do New York to L.A. or something, but okay. Sure, sure. Or... San Francisco to L.A. or absolutely yeah. Seattle to San Francisco or something, um, something more popular than that. Uh, so Political is reporting that Germany has reluctantly and belatedly signed on to the 2035 ice ban that Europe is putting forward and will no longer lobby for exemptions to the EU carbon dioxide emissions targets. Good for them. Yeah, Germany you know, was talking is, about biofuels and stuff like that, and they've decided yeah. to now uh, stop Get annoying real, us Germany. with that biofuel talk. Get real. Um, Waymo has announced that it's ready to launch driverless robo-taxis in San Francisco. They now currently provide rides for money, but there's a safety driver. So they'll need new approval to be able to charge for these services, but they're going to start doing driverless uh, taxi rides in San Francisco. And that is a huge deal. Always a huge deal. And where are we with Tesla, Brian? Where's your Tesla self-driving? Right. While well, we're supposed to be still getting the full self-driving beta in Canada by this week. So by should be by next episode. That's what you said two episodes ago. True. When you were down like 98%. Now but you're that's 99% safe. that's what score. Elon said two weeks ago. Okay, we well, never repeat what Elon says. <laughs> Since non-electric SUVs are always rolling over, they've improved safety uh, of those EV of those SUVs with large A pillars in the car, and that is blocking the view of pedestrians while turning. So pedestrian collisions are up. 
not cool. And uh, the Insurance uh, Institute for Highway Safety says these injuries are worse because of the blunt front ends of SUVs that we all love to drive. Porsche. Porsche is building its own charging network, interestingly, because we've been talking about how unreliable charging networks can be. And now they've decided to uh, build their own with amenities to boot, uh, akin to a lounge where customers might sip coffee or uh, just look pretentious with sunglasses if you're driving a Porsche, work while their batteries would charge. Uh, is this the only solution to the charging problem, Brian, for you to make your own charging network and not rely on other people? Well, I think cooperation would probably be better. So this is could be built for everybody to use, but, uh, you know, we'll see. Today, electric vehicles of all types are already displacing more than 1 million barrels of oil demand per day. And when the um, glut happened for oil prices, it was 2 million extra barrels a day, and we're already at 1 million. So that could very quickly happen. No, and that IEA story we were just talking about with those recommendations was 2.7 uh, million barrels of oil a day. I think that's that's definitely less than two years away at the rate we're going. So the Ford F-150 Lightning electric pickup truck is the, got their EPA range, and it's better than expected. It is 320 miles with 515 kilometers range with the extended battery pack, and I would suggest everyone who's buying it for a recreational vehicle to get the larger battery, even though the you know small battery is really cheap. It's just like a 220 or 230-mile battery battery but those are good for fleets inside cities i suppose tesla's elon musk reveals details about the upcoming master plan for tesla part three do you have any thoughts on this brian well probably better to wait and for the actual thing um you know he's released two previous master plans which have laid out you know in very quick bullet points uh what tesla's going to do and he's mostly accomplished plan part one and plan part deux so it is time for for plan part three and uh yeah certainly everybody's speculating about what that's going to be but growing tesla to a massive size is is one of the tidbits that he's uh mentioned so far mumbai has announced plans to go net zero by 2050 20 years ahead of india's current targets uh so that is a city in india deciding to go fairly early on you know, the head of the, the curve here on, as compared to India as a whole. Yeah, that's great. Cities sometimes have uh, that kind of power and sometimes move more quickly. So uh, finally, this week, Brian, in a major milestone for powering the world with clean energy, the world has now installed one terawatt of solar capacity. And to my surprise, that is a seventh of the world's installed electricity capacity already. Wow, that's crazy. One seventh. Yes. Uh, good news story and uh, something that I think a lot of people would be surprised about. That is our time for this week. And uh, we always like to hear from you. Our show is driven by listener feedback. So you can contact us anytime at the Clean Energy Show. That is to say, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. On Twitter and TikTok, our handle is Clean Energy Pod. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel for special features and short videos. You can leave us a voicemail message online via a web page at speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. Please consider rating and reviewing us wherever you get our podcasts, especially Spotify and iTunes. And we'll read your reviews some point later on the show. Thanks so much, everyone, for being a part of our show. Welcome to our new TikTok listeners. Make sure that you subscribe, follow the show so you get the new episodes delivered every week. And we'll see you again next week. Yeah, see you next week.